Well, welcome. The presentation you are about to enjoy is part of Humanities Washington Speaker Bureau Program. Humanities Washington is a nonprofit organization dedicated to sparky conversation and critical thinking, and it provides many other cultural programs to hundreds of thousands of people throughout Washington State each year. Thanks to support from the National Endowment for the Humanities, the Boeing Company, the Washington Secretary of State, and many private donors, Humanities Washington Speakers Bureau presenters visit all corners of the state. I would encourage you to visit their website, www.humanities.org, to find other events like this one. A note on civil discourse. The Speakers Bureau program is designed to generate an open and honest conversation on many topics, some of which may be controversial. We encourage different perspectives and viewpoints, but we also ask that you treat this topic, the speaker, and each other with respect. David George Gordon is the author of the Sasquatch Seeker's Field Manual, using citizen science to uncover North America's most elusive creature, and there's copies available for sale here tonight. Um, an accomplished science communicator, he has spoken at the American Museum of Natural History, the Philadelphia Academy of Sciences, Yale University, the Smithsonian Institution, and Ripley's Believe It or Not Museums in San Francisco, Hollywood, Perfect. and Times Square. You know you made it. He has been interviewed by National Geographic, Time, the New York Times, and the Wall Street Journal, and appeared as a guest on television shows that include the Late Late Show of Big Sporting, The View, and ABC's Nightline. Gordon lives in Seattle. Let's give him a warm welcome to Colin. All right. Well, thank you all for coming out tonight. So fabulous. And well, my name is David George Gordon. I want to be totally transparent and at the start say I've never seen a Sasquatch, nor smelled one, or heard one, nor seen footprints. I have talked to dozens and dozens of people who have a lot of incredible witnesses. And I hope sometime I will get the chance to see a Sasquatch. But just so we know, that's where it's at. Um, I also want to say that I'm kind of into the fair and balanced approach on this. I think there's a lot of uh, sightings and uh, footprints and reasons to believe in the Sasquatch, but there are also some sort of sticky wickets out there, and we have to be really discerning about how we evaluate the evidence. And that's mostly what we're going to be talking about tonight is how we all can be uh, better at resolving some of this mystery ourselves. Okay. I like starting the program with this picture <clears throat> because, well, excuse me, <clears throat> because it's the library book, 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea by um, Jules Verne. And when he wrote this book in the 1860s, this was definitely science fiction. This was like his imagination run wild. The idea of going really far down into the ocean in a big, you know, live aboard submarine like this. And in, in uh, his time, during Jules Verne's time, they believed that anything below about 100 feet in the ocean, there would be no sea life there at all. You know, it, it land of eternal darkness below where the sun can penetrate, which I think is 70 feet. And of course, we now know from a lot of studies more recently, there's all sorts of stuff down there, including glow-in-the-dark fish. There's even a large glow-in-the-dark shark that opens its mouth and attracts things with its glow-in-the-dark mouth. And all sorts of weird stuff we just had no idea about until quite recently. Um, even further down on the sea floor, we're talking about like a mile down, there are these undersea volcanoes that are literally little fountains of life. They're like little oases underwater. And all sorts of animals we've never seen before are living around those. It's amazing. It wasn't until the 1960s that people actually found the first of those undersea volcanoes. So 100 years after this book. Uh, my point really is there's a lot of stuff out there that we like to think we know about, but we probably don't. There's things waiting to be discovered. Uh, a really good example of that 
is this giant squid. People knew they existed in Jules Verne's time because they'd find pieces of them washed up on beaches, uh, ocean beaches. And they even would find pieces of them in the stomachs of whales when they were out you know, hunting whales and cutting them up. They'd find giant squid eyeballs, which, by the way, are like the size of a basketball. They're like the largest eyeballs on the planet. But they didn't see an actual live and swimming version of the giant squid until the 1980s when someone just by accident videotaped one underwater. So a mystery as well. There's like degrees of mystery. People knew it was there, but they still hadn't really seen how an entire one intact. What's that? Oh, I don't know. Just didn't quit. Oh, do you know how I got the name of Kraken? You know, I don't. But actually, hang on to your questions, though, because we both okay, that's what that's that's right. Right. Yeah, I don't know where that thing came from. Um, people who study these animals that are, you know, mystery animals uh, are called cryptozoologists. And cryptozoology is literally the science of hidden animals. So people are looking for things like the Loch Ness Monster or uh, the abominable snowman. Uh, Chupacabra, all these creatures that people say exist, but no one has the firm official stamp of proof from the scientific community. Uh, the people who are out looking for that are the cryptozoologists. And what they're looking for, like this one, are called cryptids. So if I use that word later, you'll know what that we're talking about there. Unexplained animals. And it's interesting to me that the things that we used to think for cryptids, sometimes they become commonplace and like you go to a zoo and you might see something like the old Cathy. This animal did, was not known to science until the 1880s when a Frenchman went to the Congo where they lived and shot one and then shipped it back to Paris so scientists could discover it. I say discover yeah. because Obviously, it had existed for a long time. And people who lived in the Congo were even saying, hey, there's this thing that's a, like a horse-like creature. But it wasn't until the 1880s that you know, science got bored in recognizing it. The same thing is true with the, uh, the mountain gorilla. In the late 1800s, they finally actually had evidence in cooking a, a corpse of a mountain gorilla. So they recognized that. Prior to that, Natives in Rwanda were saying things like, you know, there's another kind of guy up there in the, the mountains. You really should check it out. So on top of all of this, we also have things like this creature. This is an old postcard in my collection. Taking this from I think it's Clifford Lake, Montana, or someplace like that. Do we think this creature exists? I've seen a lot of head shaking. No, that's true. Uh, it's sort of like when you go driving around and you go to a truck stop in Montana and they have jack and right? <laughs> because we have to remember we're primates. We like monkey business and we sort of like to mess with each other and especially with each other's beliefs so we can trick people. That's a big deal. In the world of cryptozoology, it does happen from time to time, but I have to tell you, it really sets back the serious study that's going on there. It's really easy for regular scientists to go, we see, I told you it was a fake, and just kind of blow it off. OK, I've written uh, a lot of books. And this is my world, most recent one, the Sasquatch Seekers Field Manual. Uh, it was published a few years ago by Mountaineers Books, if you know them. And before that, I did the field guide to the Sasquatch. This book came out in 1992. So I've been active in this field for a while, uh, collecting information and speaking to knowledgeable people, what have you. Um, this book, I used to joke, is it's very thin. It's designed to go into like a day pack or the back pocket, or it was like 50 pages. I said, this is everything we know about the Sasquatch. And that's why it's such a thin book. Uh, we still don't know that much about the Sasquatch. So time to get a thicker book out there. And that's going to be your job. <laughs> okay, another book I wrote, The Secret World of Slugs and Snails. I'm sure you all know slugs and snails do exist. I see those in my gardens a lot. And the one that's probably gotten me the most uh, notoriety is this one called The Eat a Bug Cookbook. <laughs> this is 
This book has 40 recipes for cooking with everything from little tiny termites and ants all the way up to big tarantula spiders. <laughs> and yes, I've tried all the recipes. You can't write a cookbook from trying, without trying your own stuff. <laughs> okay, but really, what we're talking about today isn't me. It's about Sasquatch. And this is a great illustration, I think, from my book. It was done by a gentleman, his name is Richard Gatling, um, and quite experienced in drawing Sasquatch. But keep in mind, this is a composite drawing. This is like taking all these different eyewitness reports, kind of like what police do with their composite sketches, and trying to draw something that pretty much will make everybody happy. So when, when we look at this picture, some people will go, no, no, it's way bigger than that. Or, you're exaggerating, it's much smaller. And, you know, there's all sorts of variations. Some people say this creature has light hair, others say dark hair, and some people would say the arms are much longer or the legs are much better. But this is basically a composite. This is like taking all those different ideas and averaging them up. And I did the same thing when I was writing the book. <clears throat> I wanted to find the best, you know, existent printed version of what is the Sasquatch. And I found it here in this book called the Washington Environmental Atlas. It's a big folio, a big black brown folio. They have a copy of the University of Washington uh, Northwest Books Collection. So I went to look at that. This was written by the uh, US Army Corps of Engineers uh, with help from people at the University of Washington. And if you like to noodle around on the internet, and I certainly do, Sometimes you'll see pieces where people say, see, even the government knows the Sasquatch exists. It's in this Army Corps of Engineers document. But when you actually read the document, you'll see it has lots of qualifiers in it. It says, you know, this is said to be like this, or it's alleged to be, or supposedly. They're clearly hedging their bets when they're describing the Sasquatch. The thing that's really interesting, though, is when you read it, it goes on to say, it's like a two-page spread, it goes on to say, with more and more people moving into uh, the Northwest and better access to the great outdoors, you know, you can, nowadays you can have, hire someone to drop you by helicopter on the top of a, a mountain slope and slide down the glacier on skis if you want. Uh, all that's developed over the last, say, 30 years. Uh, they say it's only a matter of time before someone figures out whether this creature is a myth or a reality. And I like this expression, only a matter of time, because the publication itself came out in uh, 1974. So 44 years ago, this one was out. And we haven't really gotten the information we want to lay this idea to, to, to rest one way or the other. So in the report, though, they say, yeah, it was an ape-like creature, uh, between 8 and 12 feet tall, covered with long hair, uh, very agile and powerful. I think we can agree with this description. Uh, extremely shy, leaving minimal evidence of its presence. And like I said, uh, this came out in 19, 1975, so quite some time ago. Of course, there have been stories and legends and belief systems shared about Sasquatch for more than a thousand years. And Native Americans, if you talk to them, pretty much all the different tribes have some kind of culture <coughs> that can pretty much easily be described by the way we think of the Sasquatch. In fact, the word Sasquatch itself comes from the Chehalis tribe up in uh, British Columbia around Harrison Hot Springs. Uh, they were telling stories for a long, long time. Finally, someone in the 1920s wrote down some of these stories and had them published in the Canadian magazine. And then all of a sudden, this was now a household word. Prior to that, it was sort of an obscure word. And I'm sure we've kind of butchered it by making it more like the language word from over there. Uh, but that's a, a, a term that goes back to the American. Uh, just so all these tribes have these kinds of stories, and in many of them, it really does match up with what we think of as a Sasquatch. This really big creature that lives on the top of mountains and throws boulders and, you know, wars. It's pretty much sounds like we're talking about the same creature there. 
Uh, some of the creatures are like small. There's actually one that's a little old lady who captures kids and takes them back to her camp and eats them. <laughs> and sometimes those stories are inscribed to, you know, they say, well, they must have been telling them sort of the way we tell Grimm's fairy tales to keep kids closer to the campfire. Uh, don't wander off or you might be there's an awful lot. It also is really interesting, though, it's not just Native Americans, but people all around the world, indigenous people all over. And this is a great book by, by Ivan Sanderson. If you don't already have it or you haven't read it, you can probably get the library to order it for you. Uh, it's a thick book, like 500 pages. And it talks about these creatures. Now that we, now that we know about the cryptids, these are hominids, human-like that are supposedly living all around the world. It's really interesting to me. Uh, every continent, with the exception of Antarctica, has these stories. Uh, Africa and Australia, you name it. South America, uh, Southeast Asia, all over the place. So it's not just limited to the Northwest by any means. In fact, we have uh, characters in our own sort of collective mythology. This is called a green man. And this is, if you're looking to Celtic mythology, uh, if you were living in Ireland or Scotland or, or Britain long ago, you wouldn't go into the woods and cut down the tree without getting permission from the wild man of the woods. Bad idea. Uh, it's even in our Bible, a lot of these stories about conflict between really hairy people and really refined people. And this is the Cain and Abel, of course. But we also have, you know, David and Goliath, or uh, Esau and Jacob. There's a lot of those stories. It turns out, I've been reading a lot about this, because I'm kind of curious what is it that has us so fascinated with this topic. It turns out that at the very root of humanity, we need something to define what is human and what is not. So a lot of these cultures have these other kinds of beings as a way of describing what a human would be. In other words, you know, you think we're in our league, but check out this dude over there. That's where the kind of underpinning philosophy comes from. Of course, in the Northwest, it's almost reached epic proportions right now. It's this interest in Sasquatch. I think it's fabulous, of course. But, you know, like I saw these pictures, this, uh, these statues. This is a photo I took in Winthrop, a uh, souvenir stand. These are all made. Made in China, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> you know, really close so you can see big foot is two words. So you didn't get it exactly. But you know, everywhere you go, if you ever have <coughs> you know, the SeaTac Airport, there's a store there made in Washington. You have like a whole wall of t shirts and candy and uh, automobile air fresheners. You name it, it's become a big thing. I took this picture a few months ago, I'm glad I did, because this is a state legislature talk, discussing a bill uh, to make designating Sasquatch the official cryptid or crypto animal of Washington. <laughs> and this bill did not get out of the uh, committee, but I bet a couple of years to leave that in discussing this. I understand there's going to be a Sasquatch license plate. Yes. <laughs> so it's like really interesting to me that there's there's this really deep identity in the Northwest. I, I used to think it was all about the Olympic Peninsula or the forests of Canada, but actually, since I started doing these humanities Washington talks, I've really gotten an education about how common those sightings are in eastern Washington, areas like the Palouse, for example. And it's really fascinating to me. I love coming back here on these speaking engagements for that very reason. But I do want to say, when we think about Sasquatch, it seems to me there's like two divided camps on this. And I have these nice pictures by Rick Gettling, to, again, to illustrate this. But you know, on one hand, there's like this really, you know, wild spirit of wildness and kind of where the wild things are and eat a mountain goat if it wants to. <laughs> do whatever it wants to do. But on the other hand, it's also like this, the lone spirit of the wild. You know, it doesn't have a cell phone or even a message machine. Uh, it's just pretty much out there and 
and experiencing the world as it was meant to be experienced. So I like that aspect of the Sasquatch. It makes me think, though, in some ways that we need the Sasquatch much more than the Sasquatch needs us. So and that's kind of my take on the whole thing in general. OK, now in my book, I talk a lot about you know, sort of scientific methods and thinking like a scientist. Recently, I've kind of gotten straightened about this. We're not going to get a lot of help from the academic communities. Those, and the few people who actually have kind of gone that route complain about the fact that they've been passed over for promotions. And you know, they get judged as quacks. So they're not very prone to get involved in this. It's also an expensive study. So <clears throat> they're not getting research grants for this. But we are going to get some new evidence it's really to be from people like ourselves. So why not you know, take on the responsibility and gather some good evidence? That's what my book is largely about. Uh, in the book, I talk about those sort of basic ways to think like a scientist, if you will. And one of the rules of critical thinking is this one, uh, that absence of evidence is not evidence of an absence. In other words, just because we don't have solid proof shouldn't rule out the possibility of its existence. And we have all sorts of things in our own world that we don't have solid proof about. That's why we have things like, you know, the molecular theory. We don't really have solid proof of that. So we believe in it nonetheless. Now, when we talk about evidence, probably the, the best piece of the evidence we have, I think, book in this one picture that I took a long time ago, uh, footprints. We have lots of footprint photos and footprint casts, like this one. This gentleman is a he's a retired electrical engineer from Bremerton, Washington. I met him a while back, and he explained he would go out elk hunting on the Olympic Peninsula, and he'd find these footprints. So he'd make casts of them. Eventually, he said it was kind of like going elk hunting was an excuse to look for more footprints. <laughs> And he also told me, I just love this, that he stopped making these cats because he ran out of room in his basement. <laughs> so lots of them. So if you look at the footprint cast, uh, some of them are obvious fakes. I mean, I, laughable. Someone took a, a skill saw and some plywood, cut out a really big foot, and strapped it on their shoe and went stomping around. <laughs> but a lot of them are really convincing. They show what's called flexion of the foot, the way the foot moves. And not so it's not just a stop, stop, even though a lot of that weight must be distributed over a pretty flat surface if you're that big. But you can actually see the way the foot moves. Some of them even have what are called dermal ridges. Those are actually like fingerprints, yeah. only in footprints. Uh, and it would be almost impossible to, to duplicate that, to forge that. <coughs> footprints are probably the strongest terra firma solid evidence we have. But the other thing is eyewitness reports, and there are lots of them. Now, oftentimes, they come from people uh, like this gentleman who are actually experienced outdoors people. It's not like they just saw a bear eating the garbage and thought it was Sasquatch. Um, they really know what they're looking at and are really puzzled by what they're seeing. So when people like that tell those stories, I was saying this earlier, they have a lot they have almost nothing to gain. It's not like they're trying to get on TV, get famous, have a book, whatever. But they have a lot to lose because people start ridiculing them or hassling them. They can, you know, they're, what did you say you saw? So lots, lots to lose and not much to gain. I actually tend to believe most of the stories I've heard. That I've, I have encountered a couple of tall tale tellers, but for the most part, this is real evidence, testimony. Okay, the other rule for critical thinking that I like is that extraordinary claims require extraordinary proof. And what that means is it's one thing to say you saw bright light in the sky, and um, it's another thing to say you saw a UFO. I mean, that bright light could have been uh, a small plane or a comet or a satellite. Who knows? Yeah, exactly. <laughs> Anyway, if you're going to actually say it was a, a UFO flying saucer, then you better have something like, and it landed here, and you can see the scuff marks on the ground that will really prove it. 
My favorite extraordinary claim story took place in Squim, Washington. That's right on the, the Olympic Peninsula, but pretty much north on the road right along the street. And in the 1960s, these two guys were out grouse hunting. It was autumn, and it was very foggy there, because it was near the coast. And they suddenly saw, coming out of the fog, this really big, menacing figure. And they went, it's Bigfoot, and they ran back to swim and told everyone that they had just seen Sasquatch. And you can read the newspapers from that time. I, I had to look this up. Uh, for about two weeks, the town of Squim was like under lockdown. <laughs> people, wouldn't, people wouldn't let their dogs in the backyard or let their kids out at night or because they knew that Bigfoot was nearby. So eventually the fog cleared. They got a little headed about this. They went back to investigate for the site that this gentleman, that these gentlemen had claimed the sighting. And here's what they saw. Christ, like this. Wait for it. <laughs> it's really good. Oh. <laughs> That's right, there's some really big tree, tree jars that got struck by a lightning. <laughs> Charred into the snake. So if they come back and said, you know, we saw something really weird in the fog, like I would go on with that. That's not an extraordinary claim. As soon as they said it was Bigfoot, they couldn't prove it. And that's, the, like I was saying earlier, that's a really big setback for people who are really looking scientifically and trying to get something for real. Some of those things that people have that are putting them out there are really hard to interpret. And we have a lot of, you have to do a lot of your own homework, but also we can look deeply inside. And how do you feel about this? So it's a, a topic that's got a lot of controversy around it. I think we're all in agreement on that. And one of the things that I see, for example, this is a really interesting story. That smaller jawbone is a human jawbone, and it's just in there for scale. Because that larger, that really big one, is from this creature that existed thousands and thousands of years ago uh, in Southeast Asia, and it was called Gigantopithecus. Uh, it's supposedly the largest of the great apes. It disappeared. It lived actually around the time that some of our earliest ancestors were around as well. But then it went extinct, or so people think. Uh, another whole round of theory, though, is that it didn't become extinct. It uh, migrated north, crossed the land bridge from north, from Asia into North America, and is kind of established in our forests all the way down to Northern California and elsewhere. Uh, interesting theory. The problem with this is we don't really know much about Gigantopithecus. <coughs> it's supposedly like an eight to ten foot tall creature covered in hair, so that kind of matches the description we're talking about. But basically all we have of this creature are some bone fragments from jaw, jaw bone. Um, we don't have a full jaw bone like this. This is sort of conjectural. What if we put it together? And we only have about two dozen teeth the original teeth were actually purchased in a market in China. They were being sold as dragon's teeth. And supposedly good medicine. So to really go that way and say this resembles this is a little bit of a stretch for me at any rate. Although some fairly uh, recognized and established Bigfoot scholars would say that's the way it is. So it's nice. I guess all I'm really trying to say here is we need to evaluate all this stuff. That's like step one. Um, it's, everybody's seen this. <laughs> yeah, I want to make sure you were all paying attention. <laughs> but, but this is a famous film strip that was taken in 1967 by two gentlemen from Yakima, actually, so local heroes. And they were in Northern California. They had a rented camera, and they were on horseback in uh, an area called Bluff Creek. Sometimes you hear this referred to as the Bluff Creek footage. So, this film is, is about 55 seconds long, less than a minute. It's been evaluated and evaluated over and over again. This is actually known as frame 352. Mm -hmm. So someone has literally gone through it, looked at every piece of body, every frame of film, uh, in this 55 seconds and studied it. And you know, paleontologists and primate experts and 
human physiologists have all looked at this. No one seems to be in agreement as to whether this is the real thing, which would be an incredible piece of evidence, or a guy in a suit. Yeah, most agreement that I see is that if it is a guy in a suit, it's a really sophisticated suit, probably more than we have capabilities of making in 1967. So people kind of laughingly say they haven't found the zipper yet in the suit. <laughs> Um, there are some problems with this film, though, which is frustrating. And I'll just kind of lay them out here for you. Uh, number one, no one knows what speed the film was taken at. And this camera that they rented had adjustable speed settings, but the guys did not know this scene as a rental camera, what speed it was set at when they took that film. So if you watch this film at one speed, it looks like this creature that's sort of lumbering along. If you watch it at another speed, it looks like one of those old silent movies, Charlie Chaplin, <laughs> and the whomever's wearing the suit is having a hard time making it work. We don't have that information. We also don't have any information on where the film was developed. And this is really curious. I mean, even people who are alive today who were at the, the very first screening of that can't tell you where the film was developed. And supposedly, the chronology is the film was taken on a Friday. It was developed on a Saturday. It was shown in Yakima, so from the Yakima, on a Sunday. And actually had a big unveiling in Seattle that following Monday. So we don't know, first of all, what lab would be open on a Saturday and ready to develop the film. Uh, the other thing that's frustrating, we don't have the leader to the film. And if you ever run home movies, those clunky old movies, you get the leader first that says 10, 9, 8, 7, 6. And then a bunch of numbers go by, and those numbers are put on the film strip by the, the lab that developed it. So we'd actually have the date and the identity of the lab if we had that film strip. We don't have anything like the leader. In fact, what we have right now, the 55 seconds, isn't even the original film, it's a copy. They made multiple copies, and no one knows where the original was. So this is her, like, oh, what's that show with Angela? Murder, she wrote. Angela Lansbury. Hmm, it's suspicious. And the other thing is there are no outtakes. We only have that 55 seconds of film. If I were renting a camera and going on this big expedition, you'd think I would certainly film, here I am packing the night before, kissing the wife goodbye, and... And you know, here I am on horseback, but none of that footage has been uncovered. So we're left with this one piece of film. It's almost like that shot of the Kennedy assassination that's been studied over and over and over again, looking for new clues. So this really brings me around to this new evidence thing. And we need new evidence that can be reliable and you know, stand up, withstand scientific examination. The way to do this, I talk about it in my book, is through citizen science. And this is a, an unusual concept. It's only been in the last 20 years or so that people are using it. The idea is that you're getting people who are trained to collect this information uh, about nature and the environment. So anybody could be trained to do that. You could go to a train for a one-day workshop or whatever and kind of get the basics of what we're looking for. And hundreds and hundreds of people are gathering information. That information is later analyzed by an expert in that field who really can get down to the nitty gritty about the data that we've gathered. It seems like a good way to go. And it also turns out that citizen science is a pretty, in, back in the day, it was a pretty common thing. And people like Charles Darwin, they were citizen scientists. They did not have a special degree, a specialized degree in science. Uh, they were well educated, but it was like a general education. And anything they did beyond that, in Darwin's case, the uh, theory of evolution, or he studied barnacles for eight years, a lot of people don't know that. He was a very devout scientist. Fortunately, he had, he had a wealthy wife, so he didn't have to worry about who was paying the food bills that long. The other person I just adore is Jane Goodall. My hero. And Jane Goodall had a formal training in science. 
when she went to Africa to study chimpanzees. In fact, for the first two years, she was just there working kind of like how she had been advised what to do things. Um, she was actually the secretary of a famous scientist. And he sort of went, well, follow your bliss. Get some good stuff. Have, a, have an adventure, Jane. And after she had been doing this for a few years and finding out really amazing things, uh, they actually said, you probably should get a degree so that people will believe you in that kind of world. And she actually got enrolled in a program in London, right into a doctoral program, a PhD, without even having an undergraduate degree. Well, so a success story extraordinary for citizen okay. science. I'd say. If you look online, um, a lot of citizen science now is being done at universities and also at um, uh, universities and, and nat natural resource places. Department of Fish and Wildlife kind of projects. Uh, they're finding that they can recruit lots of people to get pretty accurate information about things they would want and would normally have to pay big bucks to get honor of research biologists to go out in the field. Uh, this is my part <coughs> where things really began at Cornell in upstate New York, their bird lab. And a lot of the projects they're talking about are actually quite simple, like just observing the action that your backyard bird feeder. If you do that every day, and you know, take the notes the way they like them, uh, if thousands of people are doing that, then they can really get a good profile of you know how is the bird life out there. It was a great year for starlings, but really hard for songbirds or whatever. These guys actually are doing a nest survey, which sounds really fancy, but they're basically looking in that box to see how many, how many eggs are in there, and later how many hatch. So citizen science, I think, is really the way to go. It's so basically getting us involved in getting the answers and not relying on somebody else. And the first thing about this, though, is wildly unpopular, because I told people you need to write things down. And you really need to write down notes. The more detailed, the better. You know, I'm always finding people, I jokingly call them the I seen ems because they're like, I seen them. But they can't really tell you much about what went up. And it's unfortunate. You know, human, the nature of our own minds, we remember some things, and some things we wind up exaggerating, right, even without intention. You know, how big was that fish? And, but we also forget a lot of the details that weren't important because we're so busy remembering those important details and hanging on to that. So they tell us to you if you have, like, you know, your insurance company will tell you if you had an auto accident, write down as much as you can immediately after. I'm sure if you come to face to face with like a, a 10 foot hairy creature in the woods, your first reaction isn't going to be hold down while I go get them. <laughs> but as soon as things do settle down, yeah, you'll be freaking. But as soon as things do settle down, make sure that you write down everything. Even like whatever noises you heard, were there birds? Did a lot of people say, you know, all of a sudden you got quiet? Well, what was it like before it got quiet? You know, write that down. A lot of what we know about life in the Northwest comes from journals from people like Lewis and Clark, those really early explorers, uh, Douglas, the botanist. And, you know, they were writing things down like crazy. They actually did a lot of illustrating as well. And they weren't distracted by their cell phones, so they didn't. You know, nowadays, I'm like, I think I'm doing great if I punch in a little bit into memos. Um, their journals are really awesome, but it's also the only baseline information we have about lots of stuff. Um, the other thing I think is really important is uh, it's called the chain of custody. Well, any evidence you find, whether it's a hair sample, or in this case, an apple cord with large tooth marks in it, uh, any of this kind of information is priceless. You know, it could be the key to solving some really serious stuff. And a lot of people don't realize that and are very kind of cavalier with the way they treat their own evidence. If you watch those CSI crime shows on TV, they're always like locking up the evidence and the evidence locker. And, you know, they're taking it pretty seriously, important stuff. Uh, a good chain of custody is nothing more than taking like a tag like this 
and putting it on with your evidence and then filling in all the details you can. And after it went from this person, did it go to this person? Did they put it in a, a laboratory? Did they take a cut out of the, the apple to analyze it? That would also be written down. I'm sure if you flip over this thing, you would see all that other additional detail. This one, by the way, it says it was preserved in Jack Daniels. <laughs> That's what they have. And then, and then later in ethanol. And you know, that seems it's humorous, but it's also important because someone later will be doing like DNA studies or something. You know, yeah. There's something that just doesn't add up here. <laughs> so important to keep all that information. I used to talk to people and it would make me crazy. They'd say they hand the Sasquatch hair and they send it off to a lab to be analyzed. And I get excited, of course. And then I'd say, what happened? And they say, well, we never heard back from the lab. And you know, I'm like, well, get some more of it here and send it to another reputable lab. And then they'd say, well, we used it all up. And I'm thinking, this is like you know, a million dollars worth of evidence that just got burned up by somebody, or maybe it got thrown in waste by a or whatever. So we really need to be protective of them. Um, I mentioned before that footprints are really common. Um, uh, go online and look at the Bigfoot Field Research Organization's website, BFRO, it's just called. Um, there's tons of uh, sightings and pictures of footprints and what have you. Um, it's no longer necessary to take those plaster casts. Uh, you can actually take photographs, digital photographs, from lots of different directions. And we have computer programs that will add that all up and average it into a, a foot. If we really wanted to, we could even print it up in 3D. Now we have the technology to do that. So that's sort of good news. You don't need to haul around 20 pounds of plastic appearance on your next tech packing print. Nice yeah. yeah, there's still nice souvenirs, though. That's for the insurance. So what's really important, though, is not to get focused on too much on the single footprints, because getting a, a, a sequence of footprints is really important. And an experienced tracker can look at the sort of left, right, left sort of step, the stride, or even the straddle, you know, the width between footprints, and tell all sorts of stuff. So measuring all of those measurements is really important. And there's not that much of it. And sometimes people make, I made a series of casts, well that's great, but we don't have the information of how much space was between each footprint. So, yeah, they can look at that and tell how, not only how large this creature was, how much it weighed, but also things like how rapidly it was traveling. Or for that matter, was it determined, you know, I'm getting out of here, or was it looking over its shoulder and kind of distracted? You can tell that from the irregularity of it. So that's really helpful. Um, another thing, you don't really need to go out by yourself. In fact, it's dangerous to go out into that country by yourself to some degree. And you can minimize the danger by going with other people. Um, there's really not much evidence that you will scare away a Sasquatch because you have several people with you. You always want to go with people with run slow. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> <laughs> right. You don't have to outrun the bear. <laughs> yeah, but it's nice this way also because you can divide up tasks and one person is going to compile the journal and the other person is going to take photographs and someone else is going to make audio recordings. It's nice to divide that up. You know, one person even, for that matter, takes your logistics and feeds everybody. That's a real great thing. And you don't need all this equipment. I mean, a smartphone like this can tell you the GPS coordinates. It can take photographs to some degree and sound recordings and all that. So it's not like you need to make it into a big pack of llama expedition, uh, unless you're going out for really long periods of time. The last thing I really want to say, well, two things. When I wrote the book, it was a little bit of a sell for mountaineers' books. I don't know if you're familiar with their books, and most of them are like hiking guides or mountaineering guides. And this was a little bit of a stretch for them. So they wanted to know, you know, why should we publish this book? And I explained to them that even if you went out and didn't see a Sasquatch, or smelled one, or heard one, or found footprints, 
Uh, you can still have this great focus for seeing things because you're on a mission. I always work better that way. And also, you'll have all the equipment and the mentality with you to document what you see. So you might see things like plants that people thought were locally exterminated, or birds no one knew went into this part of the woods. I've talked to people who've done both of those things and are able to document it and add to our understanding of nature. So I said anyone who reads this book is going to get more out of their wilderness outing than if they have. And that was good enough for Sasquatch books. I'm an, I confess I'm an incredibly slow hiker. I'm the person you want to go with. <laughs> yeah, because, because I'm looking at all the, you know, look at all that moss over there. Next to the moss is another kind of moss. And my friends are all like, come on, come on. We're ready for lunch. So I'm not a summit hiker. I'm going to get tons of detail on every trip I take. And that's really what I want to say to you is, every time you're out in nature, it's a privilege. You know, it's a real gift for us. And anything you can see and share with other people, that's going to be a gift as well. Uh, but sharing is the other part that I want to address. A lot of people think they're out for, you know, they're going to win the prize because they found um, Sasquatch. It's sort of like talking to mushroom hunters. They don't want to reveal their secret spots. Well, that doesn't really help that much. Maybe in some cases you might want to protect where the Sasquatches are, and I can certainly understand that. But the way science works, and it works well at this, is people share their observations. You know, that's how theories are developed. You say, well, I think it worked this way, and someone else goes, well, I've seen that too, but I think it's a little more like this. And eventually, a whole bunch of people get into this dialogue and shape a conclusion that we all can agree on. So that requires a lot of sharing. And if you have stories that you haven't already written down and documented, I encourage you to do that, certainly, and post it if you like on the FRO's site or elsewhere. Um, but also, like I said, be observant and be sharing. I think that's really how we're going to solve this conundrum uh, as soon as we can. And that's pretty much what I have to say. So let's turn the lights back on. And we'll open it up for people who have experiences or questions or observations, whatever. Yeah. All right. Okay. Now we had we did have several people here who have had first camp experiences, so would you like to share a little bit of what you've seen?